Hi everyone, it's Elise from Kid and Cloud of Coloring Classes and today I'm going to be showing you how to color a simple fur texture for your bear and animal stamps. This technique works best on smaller and cute style images that don't have a lot of room for detail and also teddy bears. You'll find the information on the colors I'm using in the description below the video. This technique is a preview from our brand new Adventure Awaits coloring class, which is our March 2021 coloring project for beginners over at kiddenclouder.com. If you're already a class member, breaking down your classes into smaller goals like this can be a great way to start if you're a little bit nervous or only have a limited amount of time as well. Don't forget 10 minutes of color is all you need to make a start and to take a mindful break for you to recharge and de-stress. So let's go ahead and jump in. Now when coloring any object, it's important to first keep in mind light source. Light source is anything that makes light in our scenes and it must be present for an object to be seen. It's what determines the light and shade of an object. So typically in our classes, we work with ambient lighting, which is a major source of light in a scene, like the sun or overhead lighting that casts big cones of light over your entire project. Rather than spotlighting or directional light, which is when one side appears lighter than the other side. So when working with ambient lighting, the light hits the parts of the object that are raised up toward the light rays, no matter what side the object or light is on, and the areas that are further back end up more in shadow. Don't worry if this is new to you, it will make more sense once we get started. So when coloring an object like our bear, the way that we approach this is we want to think about what is popping out toward us. So these are going to be the brightest parts or the highlights of the bear. So for example, if we're looking at our bear now, we can imagine his head like a sphere. And we know with a sphere, the middle pops out toward us with the sides all curving away to create that rounded shape. So if the middle is popping out toward us and the middle of our face is here, that's going to be our lightest and brightest part. Now the parts that are curving away on our sides to create that rounded shape, that's what forms our shadows. And it's actually called your form shadow of the object. And we also want to think about if any objects are overlapping. So when we have one object sitting in front of the other, what happens is we have a cast shadow from the object that's in front or above, casting the shadow onto the object below or behind. So you can see that shadow there on my hand. Now this determines the distance between the objects. See the closer they are, the stronger and harder that shadow becomes. And then as we lift and get further away, it becomes more dispersed. So this is showing those levels and distance. And this is the major factor for creating depth in your projects. It's the thing that I find people leave out the most because unless you're actually taught it, you don't know about it. But it's the number one thing I get asked for how to create that depth in your projects. So if we're going to color our bear, a great starting point is to actually look for those cast shadows first mainly so we don't forget about them, but also because they'll end up being a little bit darker than your form shadows. Again, remember if I bring my um, duster over my hand here, you can see how much darker that shadow is from just the regular shadows on my hand. So that's always going to be that little bit darker. If you ever feel confused by cast shadow, just throw a pencil over your hand and you can see that depth and you can see it's coming from the object above onto the object behind. So if I move this out of the way, we can take a look at our little bear here to begin with and add in some of those cast shadows. So I've got my dark brown pencil here. So I want to look at parts that are sitting behind and a really good starting point is to look at how our arm here is in front. So if I look at the arm, I can see that that comes straight across everything else and nothing's sitting in front of this. But we have a little arm to the left and we have his face to the right. So what I'm doing with my dark brown is I'm just coming in really softly and applying the cast shadow on the parts that are behind. That's going to make that arm really stand out and look like it's popping out towards you like in three dimension. You can see I'm coming around the little telescope as well, again helping that to look like it's a level closer to us. Other things that are sitting in front, we can see our little bunny friend's ear comes straight over the top, so we want to come around that. Now I'm using a really, really soft pressure with my pencils, so I'm avoiding any hard lines. 
And you can also just come around the inside of the ear here as well. Now I want the belly to be a little bit lighter, so I'm just going to come around the belly area, not colouring that in for the moment with this darker colour. I'm also doing a little bit of a car shadow around my mouse, as he's in front as well. Now while I've got this colour, I want to also add a little bit of form shadow with it. So what I'm going to look at, the darkest part or the furthest point of my form shadow is where it's curving right around away from the light. So I'm just adding a little touch of this right in my shadow area on the sides of the face. So showing how that sphere is curving around. So you can usually break down your objects into geometric shapes like this and that'll make it easier to think about the shading. So think about things like spheres, cylinders, the arms and legs are always cylindrical. So the middle is always popping out towards you, it's that rounded curve, the sides curving away from us. So arms and legs actually are darker on both sides, not just one. And that's what gives it that rounded three dimensional look. Now you can see already we've started to create a little bit of depth and detail here. But what I'm going to do now is this object is so small, instead of doing a basic blend over it, we're going to jump straight in and start adding texture. Now the texture I'm going to be adding is called stippling. So stippling is an actual art fundamental shading method. So what it is, it's the build up of little dots to help you create the shading. So I'm just going to move off to the side so I can show you. So all we're doing is just building up little dabs and dots with our pencil. Now the more dense and closer these are together, that represents more of a shadow. Then as we come through and we space them out a little bit more, you can see that that's more sparse and it's more like your highlight. So you can see I can gradiate my texture going from a shadow, mid-tone and highlight just by how dense I make the dots. Spacing out the dots will also make it easier to blend your colors in together. What we want to try to avoid is dots all ending in a straight row like this. Because what happens is all of a sudden that looks very much like a line. And if I were to come over with the other colors, it's going to be hard to remove this line. So we want to space it out with a few random dots. So it's more of a gradual fade of that color for you. So coming back to our little bear, all we do is I start in my shadow area and I'm creating this little dot texture, the stippling texture. Now don't confuse stippling with pointillism. Pointillism is an art style, not a shading method. That's when your entire picture is using dots to build up another picture. So it's a little bit different from what we're doing here. So we can use the stippling method to help us create texture rather than just doing basic blends on the page. It's a really quick and easy way that you can create texture on any of your images, depending of course on what sort of texture you want to apply. There's also many different ways to color our bears as well and our animals. This is just one of many, many different ways. And we tackle a lot of those in our other classes as well. Now this is just a really nice and easy way though for your smaller stamps to still have that texture. You can see on the arm that's peeking out from below, we can only see a very small amount of this. So by the time I add this color, I have covered most of that arm area. That's okay because it is further back. We have those levels happening there. And with the one that's further back, it will end up a bit darker because it is further from the light. Now I'm just going to come up on the arm here and I'm adding a bit of the stabbing toward the bottom. Now we don't have a lot of room on his little arms. So as I mentioned before, typically the arms will have shading on both sides curving away from the light. What I'm doing is I'm just coming along the bottom for now with this very darkest color. The bottom will be darker because it's further from the light coming down from above. Even though our top part will still have a little bit of shading curving around. Now before I get too far, I'm going to actually come through and add in his facial details so I don't miss them and so that they're already applied on my page. So I'm just using a black pencil and I'm just tracing over the eyes, nose and mouth. 
When you're doing fine details, just make sure to go nice and slow and soft and that will give you the control. Trying to leave a little bit of white straight through the middle there of the nose, a little bit of a highlight so it looks nice and shiny. Now you'll notice I am using the No Lines version of this image. No Lines is just a light grey line rather than the harsh black outline. You get both when you grab this image. The reason why I've done this is it's just going to give us a softer look overall in the finished result. But the technique for actual colouring remains exactly the same. So nothing changes whether you're using a black outline image or a grey outline image. Now what I'm going to come in and do is I'm going to add the next lightest colour which is my burnt ochre and I'm going to use that same stippling stroke straight over the top and extending further out. Notice that my dark brown has ended with that spaced out stroke so we don't have a hard line there. It's going to make it easier for this colour to blend in. Now I'm making sure as I apply this that I'm also going over the shadows at the very edges of the bear as well so we can continue to flatten that down and tone that color out. Remember more dense in your shadow areas and as you extend further out you're spacing out your little dabs so it gets a little bit lighter and softer toward your highlight area. Stippling can be a little bit of a time consuming technique. You can see here I have to spend the time building up the little dabs. This is a really great chance to practice some mindfulness as you're coloring. So if your mind tends to wander and you start to worry about other things happening in life, try to bring your mind back to exactly what you're doing in front of you. So focus on the strokes, building up the color, the pressure, you can focus on the activity at hand to help bring that relaxation. And it does take a little bit of practice, just like the coloring does as well, to feel comfortable just bringing yourself back, having that patience with yourself to be in the moment rather than thinking about all the other stresses going on as well. But as long as we're practicing, it's getting easier and you'll start resorting to that rather than stressing about other things. That smaller arm at the back is getting pretty much covered up now. The next color that I'm going to be using is goldenrod and I'm just going to be doing the exact same thing. And again, blending in closer to the middle. Now, how much or how little of each color you use is going to determine how deep your blend becomes. It's important you come the whole way back over your shadow area each time so that we are really building up the density in those shadow parts. You can even just do a line over the shadow area and that'll help to flatten down the tooth in your paper as well. So we're using a textured paper here today. So tooth is the texture of the paper. That's what grips the pencil and helps to build the color up for you. So you don't need to use any solvents when you color with pencils. This can actually break down the pigment and it means that you will lose a little bit of control and it won't end up as bright in your end result. So Solvents were traditionally used by artists to actually do large areas like backgrounds and things like that where you can have a little bit of uh, smoothness or texture depending on the effect you do. But because you're coloring large areas and you don't want to spend the time it takes to smooth it out. So for smaller things like this, it's always best just to use your pencils directly for the most vibrant, controlled and detailed look. However, you can of course to whatever technique you prefer with your pencils. But if you're markers user especially, I personally would encourage you to try 
using your pencils without a solvent because all you're doing is mimicking the marker look if you're breaking down the pigment into that paint-like surface. So you can see he's slowly getting into that middle area, that highlight. Remember, the middle being the part that's popping out toward us, and that's why we're working towards that high point. I'm coming around my ears so I can do the same thing. I've got that little bit of the highlight inside so I can make that look like it's popping out toward me. But we're really starting to fill that up quite quickly, and we're keeping all the shading there so we can see light and shade, high and low. All right, next color is jasmine. Again, straight over the top and blending in toward the middle. Now, I will have information on the paper that I've used in the description of the video as well. There's also a whole bunch of paper recommendations over on our website. If you go to kidandclouder.com, you can find our coloring FAQs page there, and that's got all of the tips for coloring, including supplies. Now I'm coming in toward the middle, but I'm not covering the entirety of the middle yet. Just let the color fade by doing a few dots on its own. Now if you have lines between the colors, like what we talked about before, the line at the bottom, it's okay. I just want to remind you that techniques take time and practice to really master. You're not going to be an instant master when you try something new. It didn't happen for me. It didn't happen from some of the greater colorists that I see doing their work. It just happens with practice. So if you find this hard today when you're practicing, it's actually a really good thing because it means it's the next lesson you need to do to help you actually level up. A lesson shouldn't always be easy for you. It should push you and challenge you out of your comfort zone because this means that it's an area you haven't yet learned that you're just learning about now which is the whole point of doing a tutorial in the first place. So don't ever be intimidated if something challenges you. Use that as a really good sign that that's actually the lesson you really should be doing and practicing again for it to get easier. But if you do find you're stuck on any aspect, you're always welcome to pop me a message and send me your coloring and I'd be happy to give you some extra personal tips on your work to help you with feeling more confident with that result. Now I've allowed my color to just fade off into the middle. You can even come in with a little bit of your white pencil and I just start just over where that last color has ended and I'll dab in toward the middle area. And all that's doing is it's just softening the dabs in toward that highlight. Now when you use paper with a tooth, one of the big problems is that you are left sometimes with little bits of white in your coloring. Now what that is, is it's the tooth of the paper that hasn't been filled yet. It's actually a really good thing. It means that your paper can hold more pigment, which means you'll get a brighter result. So we can actually repeat everything again to build up that extra depth. Or there's another little trick we can do as well. So I'm just gonna show you here, I'll just do a little bit. So this is dark brown just at the bottom, and you can see I'm literally just repeating and as I repeat I start to fill in the tooth of the paper the color is brighter and I'm getting even more control over my stroke so you can see you would just repeat as normal however another thing that you can try is a colorless blender pencil so your colorless blender pencil is essentially the same core of the pencil without any of the color. And that's why quite a few different brands will create their own blender because they all have a different core in the pencil. Prismacolor here that I'm using today is your wax-based pencil. So my core here in my blender is a wax-based core. Now, this does not add color to the page. It's very, very important. You need to have built this up to a good level of color before you come in and use a blender pencil. Otherwise, it's going to be very scratchy. You're going to get lines between the colors and it's not going to give you the result you'd like. But when you're happy with the blend, all you can do is you just bring it over. Now, it's important that you do the same stroke. Now, I can come along my edge just to really give it that definition, and then I can dab my pencil just in the same manner I was doing before, and that will just help to flatten down some of the remaining tooth in the paper. Now, this is, of course, optional. You can simply repeat everything like I did previously to help you flatten down that tooth, or you can use the blender. 
or you may even use both. You may use the blender and think, mm, I might have lost a little bit of texture in my shadow area. And if that's the case, all you do then is you just come back with the color you feel it needs. So over here, my dark brown is pretty soft, so I can bring my dark brown in again and just focus on that texture. Now remember, as your pencils get blunt, you do lose a little bit of control as well. So you can just give it a tiny turn in the sharpener just to refresh the point rather than give it a full sharpen. And you'll be able to focus on making it a little bit sharper so you can do your detailed strokes a little stronger. Now to finish up my bear, I've got a little bit of blush pink and I'm going to apply this inside my ears here. So I'm just doing a little bit, you can see, rather than covering the whole area. And then I can grab my white pencil and I can fill in the bottom side so I've got a little bit of variation. And I can also come straight in under the eyes, really, really, really soft, but you can do a little oval for some blush. Just a cute way to add some little rosy cheeks to your cuter animal images. Of course, again, optional. If you like that style or not, you don't have to add it in. If you get a bit of a line, just dab your white pencil around the edge and you should be able to soften that back out. Now, if you're working with a large image, it can be helpful to do a full round of the blend first before adding the stippling effect on top. Because as you can see, if the image was a little bit bigger, by doing the stippling just by itself, it might take me a really long time to fill in the white space of the image. So just doing a round of the blend first, just with basic blending, can just help you to fill in those areas and quicken the technique up first. But that is my little bear all done. I really hope you've enjoyed this quick lesson on how to color up your bear or fur techniques. You can try this technique on any image at all and with any color blend as well. Remember, again, coloring takes time and practice to learn, so your results may not be instantly the same as mine or others, but the more you practice, the easier it gets. Even if you don't love the result or you've made a mistake today, this is a lesson to help you learn and grow from, so give yourself a pat on the back for taking that next step. If you'd like to color the rest of this image with me, please head to kittencloud.com to view our new Adventure Awaits coloring class on sale until April 14th and you'll receive lifetime access to do this class at your own place. We'll be breaking down all the very basics in this class just like we did here today, so it's a great one for beginners. There's no lock-in contracts or timeframes with our classes as well. So I really hope you've enjoyed your lesson and see you next time. Happy coloring!